everyone for being here. I want to thank especially Scott and Linda Siebertson for welcoming us here to their ranch in uh, central Alberta, a ranch that's been in the family for about six decades and a great example of our wonderful, hardworking Alberta uh, beef producers. Uh, I want to uh, say that we're here to announce some much needed help for Alberta's drought stricken livestock, livestock producers. But before I get to that, there's a couple of uh, recent developments I would like to comment on. First of all, some great economic news out of Statistics Canada this morning with their July jobs report showing some 20,000 new full-time jobs have been created in, in Alberta last month. Uh, that takes our unemployment rate down by 0.8%, nearly a full percentage point decline in Alberta's unemployment rate. Uh, and we now have about 26,000 more people working in Alberta than in February of 2020 before the pandemic began, which is to say that our job market has uh, pretty much recovered from the catastrophe of the pandemic, the global economic collapse, and the collapse in Al Alberta energy prices. So that is great news. And we believe this is partly because of uh, Alberta being open for summer on Canada Day, on Alberta Freedom Day, uh, getting uh, tens of thousands more people back to work. But it's also because uh, of Alberta's recovery plan. That's our bold plan to build, diversify and create new jobs that we launched last June. Part of our government's focus on jobs, the economy and pipelines. We see uh, sectors right across the Alberta economy taking off right now, obviously uh, great strength in our big oil and gas industry, but tremendous progress in diversification uh, from high tech to film and television, uh, to, to hydrogen, to so many other industries. Uh, so we've seen the creation of over 180,000 new jobs since we launched the Alberta Recovery Plan in June of last year. Uh, and that's even though some sectors are still being held back by federal restrictions, like the big travel and tourism industry. Uh, and it's also, despite uh, the federal CERB payments that continue to keep some people out of the job market, more and more we're hearing the number one concern of Alberta job creators is a uh, difficulty getting people to come to work, uh, ironically, with 8% unemployment. So we renew our call on the federal government uh, to phase out uh, pandemic era uh, payments that were there when there were restrictions inhibiting the economy. So there's much more work to be done, but it's a great sign. Today's jobs report from StatsCan with 20,000 new full-time jobs in July is another great sign that Alberta's economy is back on track and the recovery plan is working. Another issue I'd like to briefly comment on before getting to today's announcement was uh, yesterday's decision by the federal government uh, to sign a childcare agreement with the province of Quebec which delivers to them exactly the same deal that we've been asking for, for Alberta parents and children. Quebec got the deal that the federal government rejected for Alberta. So we have a question for Prime Minister Trudeau. Why is it that Quebec parents and kids are more important to your government than Alberta parents and kids? Why do Quebec parents get a greater flexibility than Alberta parents? Why does there appear to be a two-tier federation? Why is Alberta being treated like a second-class province? Albertans and Alberta parents want uh, lower daycare costs and greater respect for their choices. We're going to continue to fight for that. And we will insist that Alberta be treated as an equal province. We deserve at least the same treatment that the province of Quebec gets. Uh, and that will uh, be something we are fighting for in the weeks to come. With that, let me say I'm here with Ministers uh, Nixon, uh, Dreeshen, and Horner, as well as representatives from Alberta's cattle industry to address the challenging uh, weather season that we've had here and what Alberta's government is doing about it. Livestock producers across Alberta play a key role in Alberta's prosperity and, of course, our food security. They are a huge part of our history and our identity and will be for generations to come. In so many ways, they, they are the very definition of the Alberta spirit, humble, resilient, hardworking, and resourceful. Like many Albertans, they face challenges often beyond their control. They know that with a lot of persistence and sometimes a little luck, they can overcome those challenges. 
and history shows us that they always have. Last year alone, Alberta's animal production contributed $479 million to our economy, and we saw the second best year on, in record for Alberta ag producers. But our producers also know that they have to work with Mother Nature, and that sometimes Mother Nature can be pretty brutal and uncompromising. This year has been one of those times. We've already seen many record-breaking dry days this year, and we've hit a point where many are facing severe drought conditions. I saw this uh, uh, firsthand last uh, weekend when I joined uh, these ministers out in East Central Alberta uh, to tour a number of ranches and farms uh, and to talk with producers to see firsthand the challenges that they are facing. These conditions have our livestock producers face to face with some real heartbreaking choices that put their operations at risk for the future. And they need our help. Farmers and ranchers are always there for us when we need them. Year in, year out, they're producing the food that stocks our grocery store shelves and gives us the food security that we've come to take for granted. We owe it to them to be there uh, just as they are there for the rest of us. Through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, Alberta is taking immediate action to provide emergency support to Alberta's livestock producers. Today, I'm announcing that Alberta is allocating $136 million in immediate financial relief uh, for our livestock producers and Alberta beekeepers. In addition, we've made a request under the joint federal-provincial agri-recovery program for the federal government to provide an additional $203 million on top of our contribution for a total relief package of $339 million. This is based on the 40-60% cost share uh, framework of the program. Our request is subject to review at the federal level, but I'm hopeful that it will be approved shortly because there's rumors that there may be a federal election called soon. And I should say that just before our announcement, the federal government announced $100 million in immediate funding for uh, agri-recovery for farmers in Ontario, Manitoba, uh, Saskatchewan, BC, and Alberta. So I would like to take this as a hopeful sign that they will approve our request for full funding under agri-recovery. Minister Nixon uh, ha also has made a number of temporary changes to grazing and water regulations that will allow livestock producers to access new sources of water and feed for their animals. This, and he'll say uh, more about that in just a second. This new money and these changes won't solve all the problems created by drought conditions in parts of the province, but they will give farmers and ranchers some room to breathe and hopefully a bit of peace of mind. These food producers and entrepreneurs, heirs to a legacy and the keepers of much of Alberta's land we have to be there for them. They create the very best food for Albertans, Canadians, and for, through exports for people around the world. So we need, to have, we need to have their back when they're going through hard times like right now. So now I'll now turn it over to uh, Ministers Adrian, uh, Nixon, and Horner for a bit more information. We'll hear more and then happy to take your questions. Well, thank you very much, Premier, and thank you, Scott, for having us out here in your in your pasture. We were hoping if we had a drought announcement, we might actually get some rain, but uh, that obviously did not happen. But uh, as, as the Premier mentioned, we do have a, a very exciting announcement today with the $340 million agri-recovery program. That will work out to about a $200 per head payment to, to the cattle industry, and, and it's a sliding scale when it goes to the other livestock sectors across the province. And it will be administered through the Alberta Financial Services Corporation, AFSC. But as the Premier alluded to, a full federal funding to an agri-recovery program is a 60-40 split with the federal government. And so that is over $200 million that Alberta is requesting from Ottawa to make sure that our livestock industry here in the province is actually getting the, the support that they need. And obviously why the drought and the fact that we're having uh, feed shortages is exacerbated by the U.S. government having about a $195 uh, dollar a head subsidy in certain states, and we're actually seeing a near record amount of feed being shipped across the border uh, at these times. So it's really just a problem of, of our cattle industry. Yes, they're having record high feed prices, 
but they're also seeing a lack of availability of, of their own feedstocks as well as as their pastures being being dried up. So the, the program details of, of how it'll actually be rolled out, it'll be an initial $96, a, uh, or $94, I, sorry, uh, initial payment that'll go out per head uh, immediately. And then if approved with the federal government funding, there'll be a $106 final payment that goes out at the end of the year for our livestock sector. So exciting uh, relief for our livestock industry to make sure that they can feed their animals and they won't have to face a choice of depleting their herds, which uh, would have huge economic consequences to the province of Alberta. So with that, I'll turn it over to Minister Nixon, who uh, has some very exciting park announcements. Well, thank you, Mr. Dreeson. Thank you, Scott, again for uh, having us out here this afternoon. It's great to be home in central Alberta. We are on the east side of the nixon Dreeson line, which is always good to be over here. But I have to say a little quick plug for uh, Sundry today. That's the Sundry Pro Rodeo today. So if you're happy after this announcement, take a little drive out west uh, to the crown jewel of the Cowboy Trail and enjoy some Pro Rodeo. Uh, it is good to be here today uh, with, with the Premier and Minister Dreeson, Minister Horner to be able to talk about uh, a very important issue inside our province right now. Uh, as the Premier mentioned, we were traveling south uh, this past weekend and a week, the, actually the whole week I was able to spend uh, in southern Alberta seeing uh, the tough conditions that are facing our agriculture uh, community right now because Mother Nature simply just is not uh, cooperating. Uh, we wanted to do our part uh, as the Ministry of Environment to be able to help uh, with the coming months, uh, particularly around livestock grazing. Uh, and access to water. While we can't, in the Ministry of Environment, make it rain, unfortunately, we do have uh, some opportunities where we can help out. So I, I am happy to announce today that, first of all, effective immediately, uh, the Department of Environment and Parks will be accepting subletting applications on grazing dispositions across the province uh, to be able to make sure uh, that our, our grazers can be able to have access to public land uh, that, where there is feed uh, that, need, that, that can be utilized to be able to help livestock producers. Uh, for any grazer who is interested in that, I encourage them to call 310 Farm. Uh, and uh, our department will make sure that we connect uh, them with grazers across the province to be able to get access to feed. Second, effective immediately, Alberta Environment Parks will be opening up uh, public land across the province uh, to work with uh, grazers to be able to get access to feed and to haying on public lands across the province to be able to. Uh, to work our way forward to be able to get as much access to feed in areas where we do have grass available uh, for the industry. Third, we will be working to keep the eastern slopes and the forest reserve uh, fully open as long as possible this year. Normally, uh, we would start to take the cattle off of places like the eastern slopes uh, by September or October. We do have places in this province where we're going to be able to keep cattle on the landscape longer. And so we'll be working with grazers in those areas to keep their cows in the eastern slopes as long as possible. Uh, to prevent uh, having to use winter feed as long as possible. And fourth, uh, we have uh, yesterday I signed off on a program in Alberta Environment and Parks that will speed up water licenses and access to water uh, for grazers uh, and for producers for their livestock uh, inside our province. Again, call 310 Farm if you're interested in that. Uh, we have made it uh, a regulation that uh, Environment and Parks employees must respond to producers within three business days to be able to help them get access to that. You will be assigned a staff who will walk through that process with you uh, and help you find access to water, either through the approval process that you're already taking with the department or ultimately uh, through uh, the uh, uh, finding uh, uh, water elsewhere within the province that Alberta Environment Parks has access to to be able to help uh, producers. We will also be working uh, very closely in the coming days with environment organizations and land trust organizations across the province and showing them the steps that we've done as the largest landowner inside the province, Alberta Environment and Parks, uh, and opportunities that they could have to be able to help producers uh, from north to south, east to west, to be able to get access to some large landscapes to, to uh, help with feed. So these are some of the steps that we'll be taking uh, in Environment and Parks to be able to support uh, our friends in agriculture and forestry going forward and to be able to stand uh, shoulder to shoulder with the agriculture industry and be able to make sure we can get through this tough time. And with that, I'll turn things over to uh, our friends at the Alberta Beef Producers uh, to come on up and tell us uh, what they think about this important announcement. Thank you very much. 
Um, I'd like to I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for inviting us here today to be a part of this very very special announcement. We appreciate it. Thank you. On behalf of the Alberta beef producers, the executive and board of directors, I'd like to express their sincere appreciation. Our executive would have loved to have been with us today, but they are all dealing with drought on their own farms and ranches back at home. Earlier last month, the extreme hot and dry weather had many producers concerned with access to summer and winter feed and water supplies. Alberta beef producers worked with the Alberta Cattle Feeders Association, Alberta Grazing Leaseholders Association, the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, as well as the Western Stock Growers Association to identify recommendations to the government that would give producers alternative options before selling off their breeding animals. We had been working closely with the government of Alberta over the summer months as the drought situation continued. Last weekend, Premier, Premier Jason Kenney, Minister Dreeshen, Minister Nixon, and Associate Minister Horner spent a day with our executive seeing firsthand the severity of the drought and how it has impacted the summer and winter feed for beef producers. Minister Nixon, thank you for the quick reaction from Alberta Environment and Parks to open more grazing and forage opportunities for Alberta producers. Access, alternative access to feed and water will be a savior to many of those producers. To Minister Dreeshen, thank you for your announcement of the support that will give many struggling producers some much needed hope. We look forward to working with you in the coming days to roll out the application details to aid as many producers as possible. Beef producers take great pride in their herds and their genetics and prioritizing animal welfare. We appreciate the government of Alberta's stepping in before a bad situation even gets worse. Again, thank you very much to the government of Alberta for this very special announcement. If I could please ask uh, Scott Severston to come up. Thanks, Scott. <coughs> First of all, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, it really means a lot to us. And uh, on behalf of myself and my family, I'd really like to thank the government of Alberta for demonstrating some incredible leadership throughout this drought and recognizing that farmers and ranchers play a huge role in our province. Uh, the farm families, we work extremely hard to put food on the table for a people here in Alberta and also all around the world. Each and every day, we are responsible for hundreds of head of livestock, make sure they have feed and water. But the combination of extreme heat and uh, a lack of rain has placed a strain on our feed and water resources, posing a threat to the ag agriculture industry in whole. And I thank you very much for understanding the hardships that farmers and ranchers face as a result of these prolonged drought conditions. So on behalf of my family, we are extremely appreciative that you listen to those that are out day to day uh, on the ground doing all the day to day things and responded so qu quickly with a common sense approach, uh, a set of supports that is, it truly means a lot to us on the, at the ground level. Thank you very much again for coming out. All right, thanks everyone. That concludes our uh, formal remarks for today. And we're go now gonna be moving over to a media Q&A. Um, for uh, any journalists who are assembled here today, uh, when you're asking your question, there's a unit mic uh, just set up behind the uh, cameras that I'd like you to uh, please use to ask your questions and please identify uh, yourself and your news outlet uh, as well. Before we get to you though, we're gonna take the first two questions off the, uh, off the phone lines. Uh, and then if we have time after the people here have asked, we'll go back to the phones. So with that operator, can you please put through our first question? First is Alex McQuaig with the Western Producer. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and thanks for letting me ask a question here. I'm just curious about the numbers here. Uh, if I understand it correctly, it's a 94 per head immediate subsidy in conjunction with the agro recovery program. Uh, will the province, you know, if the complications uh, develop due to the federal election, will the province uh, commit to releasing uh, the other funds uh, outside of the agro recovery uh, program? 
Yeah, great, great question. And uh, something that we we've had approvals here in the province for 136 million, so our portion of the 340 million dollars. And we are hopeful that the federal government will fully fund and, and step up to their commitment level of 60% of on the agri recovery. So that's a over $200 million ask. The, the 100 million that just got announced this morning, again, that spreads across five provinces. So we are hopeful that the federal government takes this seriously and understands the needs of our livestock sector, not just in the prairies, but also in BC and Ontario, and that they take this drought situation seriously and they actually commit to the full funding of the agri recovery program. And Alex, do you have a uh, follow-up at all? Yeah, one for Minister Nixon. Uh, regarding the opening up of public lands for grazing, uh, will that be uh, solely for Alberta producers? We have quite a few uh, cattle producers along the eastern border with Saskatchewan. Will they have any opportunities to uh, take advantage of those uh, increased grazing opportunities? Well, our primary focus, of course, is going to be on Alberta producers, but you are correct. Uh, we do have some grazing that goes back and forth between uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. Of course, we work closely with our partners in Saskatchewan. And so uh, those from Saskatchewan that are grazing cattle on our existing uh, public land system will certainly uh, be part of this process. Uh, but the overall intention is to focus on making sure we got feed here for producers in the province of Alberta. Okay. Thanks very much. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? James Keller with the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, James. Uh, this is a question for the Premier uh, on the COVID-19 situation. Um, with the recent changes to the COVID protocols in Alberta, some businesses have expressed some concern and some confusion about sort of where they fit in all of this in terms of how do they keep you know, employees safe, how do they keep customers safe. What is the government's advice to them in terms of any public health measures they need to be putting in place? Or is the direction really just feel free to return to uh, pre-pandemic operations? No, actually, we have provided pretty comprehensive advice to employers at Alberta Biz Connect. I think it's albertabizconnect.ca, uh, which is a website maintained by the Jobs and Economy Ministry uh, and provides uh, advice to employers on how to be COVID safe. And so there's a good general and some sectoral advice there. I understand that they'll be updating it with some more general advice about uh, uh, what employers can do uh, to be COVID conscious. Is uh, uh, as I and Dr. Hinshaw have both said, COVID is not over. We have to continue to uh, manage uh, COVID as a health challenge, but one amongst many other health challenges. And I think employers understand that. Uh, you know, if they have somebody uh, who comes in uh, in in the pre-COVID era with uh, with an obviously infectious uh, illness, uh, a responsible employer would, I th hope, ask them to. Uh, to go home and would support that choice, uh, for example. So um, managing uh, public health uh, concerns in a workplace is not a new thing for Alberta employers. Uh, and so, uh, as I say, uh, that uh, there is general advice available and sectoral advice avail available uh, online through Alberta BizConnect. Uh, and and we, as you know, uh, Dr. Hinshaw and ministers of the government have done a constant cycle of uh, telephone town halls with different uh, sectors. Uh, she'll be doing another one with physicians uh, later this week, and um, I'm sure that uh, she and, and relevant ministers will be available to answer questions to employers if they have any about how to uh, uh, um, uh, prov help support their employees with ongoing management of COVID. Hey, James, do you have a uh, follow-up at all? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm just wondering for you know, members of the public, particularly customers who might be going into businesses where they see, you know, continued things like masking or social distancing or those sorts of things. Is there some mixed messaging in here? Because you know, the message from the government seems to be that, you know, the pandemic and the need for restrictions is essentially over, you know, that things are kind of safe to be able to return back to normal. Uh, but people still will be encountering you know, very, you know, in some cases, varying levels of uh, public health measures depending on where they're going. So, like, how should people assess kind of the level of risk? If you know the message from the government is things are pretty safe, and uh, they might be seeing measures elsewhere, though. Yeah, thanks for the good question, James. Uh, as Dr. Hinshaw has said, everybody has to assess their own uh, risk level, take on board all of the information, and uh, make responsible choices. If somebody, uh, for example, is uh, very elderly and immunocompromised and they're concerned, uh, then uh, they may very well choose to uh, 
uh, put, a, put on a mask in a public venue uh, indoors or if they're in a crowded spot, uh, that, that, that kind of choice makes sense. And so, uh, you know, I think the, uh, the health department uh, and Dr. Hinshaw are providing a lot of guidance about uh, what can be uh, useful interventions for individuals. Uh, it's up to employers to decide whether uh, they're going to have a, a mask requirement for staff uh, or for um, a clientele. Uh, we respect the choices that they make. One thing we encourage everybody to do is avoid um, turning masking, as an example, into a divisive issue. Uh, don't judge people whether they choose to wear a mask or not. Uh, the, there are different people with different levels of, of um, risk tolerance, if you will, and different health conditions, and, and I think we should respect the choices that individuals make. All right, so we'll just jump to the uh, journalists who are here in person today. I see somebody at the mic, and I'll let you go. Please keep yourself to uh, one question and one follow-up. Bonjour, Monsieur Kenny. En français, je vais en ondes bientôt, donc je vais poser ma question maintenant. Euh, vous avez encore des critiques du côté d'Ottawa, la ministre Patty Aydou, qui vous demande de faire tout votre possible ou ce qui est nécessaire pour protéger les adversaires contre la COVID-19. Chaque jour, il y a aussi des manifestants dans les rues à Edmonton et Calgary. Est-ce que vous pouvez répondre aujourd'hui que vous en faites assez pour protéger la santé des Albertains? Est-ce que vous voulez en anglais et en français? Uh, on peut commencer, oui. Les OK, I'll just translate, because we have live viewers um, watching online. So the question was essentially, what's my response to Minister Hadju's letter to Minister Chandro uh, about uh, COVID management? And I'll, I'll answer in English first and then in French. Um, you, I, I find this ironic coming from a minister who refused to close the borders of COVID hotspots at the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, who effectively facilitated the entry into Canada of the virus when other countries like in East Asia immediately shut their borders in January and February of last year. Minister Hadju was arguing to keep them open as long as she could, even from the worst hot spots in the world. She still hasn't taken responsibility for that uh, incompetent uh, and dangerous decision. Uh, she was arguing against masks. She was following blindly the mistaken uh, advice of the World Health Organization that there was not a pandemic until they finally changed their tune in March. So we're not going to be, uh, take lectures uh, from Minister Hadju, particularly when it her appears uh, that she and her uh, boss, Justin Trudeau, are hell-bent on a federal election campaign. If they really are that concerned about COVID, then why is she uh, getting ready to, to start putting up campaign signs? Uh, it is, uh, I, I think this is just a, an obvious uh, political ploy, um, and it's divisive. Uh, I would ask that uh, the federal government respect the expert advice of each province's public health officials, in our case, our uh, brilliant chief medical officer, Dr. Hinshaw. Uh, the plan that we are moving forward with was designed by uh, Dr. Hinshaw and her team uh, in order to address all public health challenges and recognize that there's not just one uh, health challenges that we, we face as a society. Uh, and uh, so I at least respect uh, her expert advice and it would be nice if the federal government would show similar deference. I'll, I'll try to provide the same or similar answer in French. Um, C'est le même ministre adjoint qui a refusé de fermer les frontières du Canada des pays uh, où, uh, au début de la pandémie, uh, qui ont transmis énormément le, le virus COVID-19. Alors, ce n'était pas une décision responsable. Elle n'a jamais pris uh, imputabilité pour cette décision-là. Elle, elle, elle s'était opposée aux utilisations générales des masques uh, par les gens au début de la pandémie et elle a endorsé uh, la perspective farfeluse de uh, l'Organisme mondial de santé uh, qui a dit uh, jusqu'à mars dernier qu'on n'a pas eu une pandémie globale. Alors, uh, je crois que uh, nous ne nous prenons nous prendrons pas les leçons de la ministre Hadjou, particulièrement étant donné qu'elle et son patron, M. Trudeau, sont uh, évidemment, ils sont prêts à lancer les élections fédéraux généraux, généraux, euh, fédérales générales. Euh, et euh, s'ils si sont vraiment inquiétés de la menace de COVID-19, euh, pourquoi est-ce qu'ils lancent les élections prochainement? Ça ne fait pas de sens. English and in French, you touched a little bit on this deal between Quebec and Ottawa about the child care. Um, you look frustrated about it. Uh, what are your expectations now uh, from Ottawa? Yeah, look, 
At, at the very beginning, we said to Ottawa that uh, we appreciate any additional support they're willing to offer to help parents cope with the costs and challenges of daycare and childcare, um, but that we want maximum flexibility here in Alberta, and we very specifically said that we want the same kind of flexibility that Quebec traditionally gets. Uh, Ottawa told us, no, that's not on. We're not going to give Alberta that kind of flexibility. And then yesterday, they signed exactly that kind of deal with uh, the province of Quebec. So apparently, one province is more equal than the others. Apparently, Quebec parents and kids get favorable consideration over Alberta parents and kids. This is indefensible. It is indefensible. If Quebec gets this kind of flexibility to best support the local needs of their parents and children on childcare, then Alberta must have the same flexibility. This is part of a pattern. You know, the government of, I'll give you an example, the government of Saskatchewan asked for the same deal that New Brunswick got on uh, the carbon tax, where basically that province relabeled their gas excise tax as a carbon tax. Ottawa said, A-OK, -okay, uh, we approve of this as being compliant with our carbon tax scheme. Then Saskatchewan comes along this uh, spring, asks for New Brunswick's deal, and the feds say, absolutely not. Why are the Western provinces being treated second class by Justin Trudeau's Liberal government? Why don't we have uh, equality of provinces in this federation? Why don't Alberta parents get the same uh, flexibility that Quebec parents do? And the reason we're asking for this flexibility is because only about 20% of parents use the kind of childcare that the feds are saying that they, they are willing to fund. What about the other 80%? The shift workers, rural parents, indigenous parents uh, in remote areas. What about um, parents who use uh, local day homes or ex have relatives helping with care for kids? Why aren't their choices uh, equally valid? So we are going to fight uh, for equal treatment we demand the same deal that Quebec got yesterday, and there is no gr good reason why we shouldn't have it. I'll say this a similar thing in French. Um, uh, Excusez-moi. Uh, après le budget fédéral, nous avons demandé une entente avec Ottawa sur le soin de, des enfants uh, pour flexibilité maximum comme le Québec a toujours dans ses ententes avec le, le fédéral. Mais le gouvernement libéral a refusé les demandes de l'Alberta à ce point-là. Hier, ils ont signé une entente avec Québec qui a donné toute cette flexibilité, exactement l'entente que nous cherchons dans le meilleur intérêt des parents et des enfants en Alberta. Alors, pourquoi est-ce que le Québec a un traitement préférable aux autres provinces comme l'Alberta? Et euh, euh, alors, euh, nous voulons euh, euh, la même sorte de flexibilité pour qu'on puisse appuyer les choix de tous les parents en Alberta, pas seulement une minorité. Et on va lutter pour un traitement égal dans la fédération, pas seulement en ce qui concerne les garderies, mais dans tous les autres enjeux. Nous avons le temps pour deux autres questions aujourd'hui. Adam McVicker with uh, Global News here. I guess uh, my first question for whoever can answer is... Uh, Adam, could you just speak a little more into the mic? It's hard. Right here? Yeah. Got me? Okay. I know uh, you've never worked with the mic before, so... <laughs> Very good. Um, how can producers access uh, this funding that's being released here, um, and what should producers know about accessing those, uh, those funds? Yeah, thanks. So the, the initial payment will be going out as, as soon as possible. So once we get the, the approval from, uh, well, hopefully, and the, the 200 million funding from the, the federal government, it will go out as, as soon as possible. The, the second payment, the $106 uh, dollar per head payment, that will be later in the year. So there will be uh, a receipts-based system where you show some type of additional cost that's happened, whether that's just directly buying uh, more expensive feed, whether it's water costs or temporary fencing, or even a, an opportunity cost of a lot of ranchers that are digging into multiple years of reserves of, of feed stockpile, that that would all be included in, uh, in that secondary payment. So the first initial payment will just go out to, to current breeding stock um, numbers right now, or as soon as it can, and uh, the second payment would be at the end of the year. And, and the reason for the two payments is just to encourage 
uh, people to hold on to, to their animals to keep the herd uh, maintained as, as much as possible. There's always a typical 10-14% cull rate that ha happens typically, but we want to make sure that we can maintain and there's not a huge sell-off uh, in the livestock sector. And I guess my follow-up, um, I know there's been reporting on this regarding the, the drought situation. Can you give us just an idea of what our producers are dealing with when it comes to this drought and just kind of how bad the, the situation out there is? Sure. Only about 20% of uh, crops and pastures across the entire province are, are doing well. Uh, the vast majority are, are poor, or extremely poor. And uh, something that we as, as a province did early this year was actually reduce crop, pasture and forage insurance premiums by 20%. And we actually saw 400 additional farmers take out and, and ranchers take out that insurance, as well as 1,400 increasing their insurance payout. So AFSC is, is estimating now that it could be about a billion dollars of insurance payments going out in the ag sector here in Alberta alone. And uh, so it is something that's it's similar to 2002 drought uh, that lots of lots of farmers and ranchers remember. And uh, so that's that's the severity of of this current situation. Sure. Yeah, I'd just like to take the opportunity to to, you know, let you know that right now producers across this province are doing their very best to try and determine with what they have available, what feed they have available, what looks like they could potentially source. They need to, at this point in time, determine how many cows they can keep and if there is that possibility or how many they're gonna have to call. So these are some extremely difficult decisions where producers are you know, trying to determine their very livelihoods and how they're going to handle the situation going forward and of course, you know, we don't want to see a mass cull because we want to make sure that that we as beef producers keep a strong industry here, not only as from the cow calf sector, but through to the feedlot processing and to the retailer. So very, very important, extremely difficult decisions that producers are having to deal with right at the moment. This announcement today gives them some breathing room and hopefully allows them to start looking on how they can source some additional feed to get them through either the next few months or into the winter. All right, now for our last question of the day. Uh, this is for the Premier, if he's available. Dan Singleton from the Albertan and Olds. Um, do you have, is it your feeling that the um, Alberta Provincial Police would be a welcome in Alberta, particularly rural Alberta? Yes. You do? Well, why do you think that? Uh, well, we all know there's been a rural crime crisis for several years, huge increase, especially in property crimes, increasingly violent crimes. You saw what happened the other day in Penhold, where some, uh, apparently some meth addict uh, did three home invasions, beat people in a, in a family with a bat came back repeatedly and this guy kept getting put back out on the street and uh, ultimately it led to the dad having to defend his family sadly with uh, a lethal effect uh, we've seen too many things like this especially in rural and one of the issues is unacceptably long police response times uh, I think we can do better with a community police model it you know that's what the city people have with the municipal police forces in calgary edmonton uh lethbridge and 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 in four other communities if it's good enough for city people why isn't it good enough for country people rural people to have their own local police force that's what an alberta provincial police force would provide we respect the rcmp we and uh, the many great rcmp officers who serve our communities we honor them uh, and we support them but the rcmp is a, a huge national complex organization with a, a unfocused mandate they do everything from highway patrol in rural alberta to complex national security and cybercrime stuff uh, in ottawa that's not community that's not a community policing model and as you know very often we get a kind of revolving door of personnel they'll come in here from new brunswick or ontario wherever set up in a community and they're gone in three four years i think it would be awesome to have a in principle to have a provincial police force where uh, girls and boys can can dream of 
becoming a police officer and serving in their community for the rest of their lives, a community they understand, where they know the local people, they know the geography, they know the issues. That's the community policing model. So we're working on uh, further research. Uh, we've done a, uh, an initial study uh, with, uh, I believe it's with Deloitte's, uh, that through the Department of Justice and Solicitor General, and um, we, we've sent them back to, they're going to launch consultations, I think shortly, uh, Minister Maddie will have something to say about that, more, more detailed consultations. Uh, one of the concerns we hear from municipalities is they want to make sure if we go to an Alberta Provincial Police, it doesn't cost them more, and we're going to guarantee them that this model would not cost them one cent more. We also want to work closely with Indigenous communities to make sure that uh, they are supportive of a uh, pr local provincial policing model that would massively improve responsiveness to and governance involvement of Indigenous communities. Um, and this would also be a, a proposed model that is uh, focused on crime prevention and addressing many of the social gaps um, that, that uh, uh, are connected to law, law enforcement issues. So the work is ongoing. Um, and we haven't made final decisions, but you can see, I believe there would be many advantages in principle to a, a, a local police force. You can go quick, ahead. Quick, I, I, quick, quick follow-up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any idea when we'll see a referendum on the uh, this issue? Well, um, no, decision, no final decisions have been made. Uh, we want to take this to the next step, which is uh, really in-depth consultations, especially with municipalities and Indigenous communities, based on the uh, model that has been prepared by Justice and Solicitor General. So those consultations will happen this fall and into the winter. Um, and then we'll, uh, I think, late next winter, spring of 22, uh, make a decision about uh, whether go or no go uh, on this. It would take us uh, three, maybe four years if we decide to go in this direction to transition because um, we need to give notice for, in principle, for uh, potential cancellation of the police services contract with Ottawa. Uh, and there would obviously be a lot of transitional stuff. And let me say, I was talking earlier about Ottawa giving Quebec its desired deal on daycare, but refusing the same deal for Alberta, I don't see policing as being any different. Quebec has always had its uh, provincial police force. Ontario and Newfoundland have done so. And I can tell you I've talked to other premiers who are very interested in the research that we are doing about a potential local uh, police force, uh, just as the city of Surrey has done by pulling out of their RCMP contract. That's a city with 650,000 people. It's the size of New Brunswick. And they did this as well because they want local community policing. So I think there's a bit of a trend happening here, and uh, just stay tuned. All right, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, appreciate everyone who came out today. Thanks again to the Sievertsons. Really appreciate you guys having us out here. Hey, Gary, how are you? Good to see you. Thank you.